right, I'm going to I'm going to take a slightly different approach um, for this tutorial. Um, I mean, I, I like the example this morning where it's a 17 line and a 46 line example, and there's there's time for everyone to try it. Um, but in this tutorial, I'm going to try to go through the processing of this entire data set. I'm not really sure how Carol Nass did it, but I, at least from my point of view, that there's there's too much to say to say it as well as have everyone try it out at their terminals. So I'm going to hope that maybe you've tried this already, maybe done some of this last night. Who, who's actually processed the thermoisin with CCTVX so far? So several people have done it. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to just try to go through the tutorial and try to explain as much as I can and hope that people will either absorb um, information that I'm giving or, you know, please ask questions. Um, and Aaron can also answer the questions. Just want to remind everyone where the tutorial is. So that the way to find it, even if you don't don't write it down, it's cci.lbl.gov. That's the web page for my group and Paul Adams group. So that's where we are. That's our home page. And then on the Expel link, that goes to our wiki page. And then there's a lot of information about the program on the wiki. In fact, so just to, before, uh, before this month, what you would do if you want to learn about it is you go to the tutorials down here. So here, there's other tutorials that we did last year um, at Slack. Um, and there's some good information here. We had, um, uh, well, for example, resolving an indexing ambiguity. The Brem and Diederichs algorithm is over there. But let me go back to the main page. So here's where we are now. So it's the 2000, 2014 workshop tutorial. And um, there's a bit about getting started. There's a list of examples. And the one I'm going to be talking about is the L498 uh, thermal Ison. And then there's getting started. And this is, this is critical. Um, I've already had about three people come up to me and say, you know, I can't run anything. So here are the problems that we found. This is exactly the steps that you need to set up your environment so that you can run CCTVX. So here, here are the instructions for doing it. And here's the mistakes we've already found. Uh, we had one user who, let's see. So this has to be put into your bash RC file. So I think one user misspelled it. Uh, it didn't put the, word, the letter G here. So that was one thing. So you have to check your spelling. There was another user who was actually linking to the wrong place here in this step. And we had one user who was using um, bash profile instead of bash RC. And for some reason that's obscure to me, that didn't work. So. Um, this seems to be a critical, you know, unfortunate as it is, this seems to be a critical um, uh, uh, barrier to actually getting things started. And it's frustrating because um, there's a lot to do after you actually set up your environment. So I'm going to go to that. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the web page. And I'm going to have a login shell somewhere over here after thanking the sponsors once again. So, no, I'm not going to save that. So, there we go. So, I've logged in to PS login, and now I'm going to, again, uh, we can't just do our work there. We have to do uh, SSH dash, I use YAC to PS Anna, PS Anna. And then uh, everyone's created a my release directory. I actually call mine my tutorial, um, but that doesn't matter. And then inside of that, I had to create a subdirectory that would contain all the configuration files. And I, I see the, the other programs have you know, put in a, a tar file all the config files to use. I've, I've actually posted the text of these files on the wiki. So you can grab them that way and just cut and paste. So there's this handful of configuration files that you need. It's sort of the same idea. So let's see. Oh, yes, the other thing we need to make sure of doing is, is running SIT setup. That's um, to run the package manager in such a way that you can do your work um, with, uh, with IANA. Actually, so CCTVX is already set up in your bash RC file. 
But to run Piana, you must be in this directory and you must run sit setup every time you log in. So that's just the requirement. So now, okay, it's broken up into six sections. Section number one, discovery of the discovery of what's in the data set. So the, the scenario here is I'm giving you some data and I'm not telling you anything else. So let's find out what's, what's in the data. So discovery, uh, first we're going to list the data. So let's just see what's in the directory. As I explained yesterday, this is the data directory. And for any experiment you do at Slack, it's going to be like this. It's, it's going to be an experiment name, like CXI84914, and then an XTC directory. And then um, here's the list of files. So. Experiment 157, and there's going to be a number of runs here, run 16 through 73, and that's what we have. So here's the first thing we can do. In, in the spirit of discovering what's, what, what data are in uh, those files, we're going to run a PyAnna script with a CCTBX plugin that averages all the images from each run individually. So I'm going to show you the configuration for that operation. So what are we doing here? We're going to be running a CCPX module called mod average. Um, these are the parameters we need to run it. We need a calibration directory, which is a place that we've put in what Slack thinks is the metrology for this detector. I'm not going to go into any more detail than just that. Um, also, the address of the detector that I'm interested in um, as was discussed earlier today, it's a rather complicated naming scheme, but this is what we're going to be pulling out of the XTC stream. If I wanted the downstream detector, I would have said CXI DSD here instead of DS1. Aaron spoke uh, before about the de detector Z offset. This is what I think it is, 571. Um, it's going to turn out to be wrong, and I'll show you that later. And now I'm going to be making three different kinds of output. Um, for each set, for each set of runs in, no, for each set of images in each run, I'm going to be calculating a mean, a standard deviation, and a maximum value composite image. And these uh, names here just show where those images are going to be written. Um, I'm using a little bit of parameter interpolation here, so your username will automatically be substituted inside these curly brackets. Um, as will the experiment number and the run, and that's it. So that's our configuration file for running IANA. You okay with that, Aaron? I just wanted to. I just wanted to comment. Um, when you run um, Cheetah or other programs, uh, they have these configuration files also. This is the PSANA, PyANA way to to control how those programs run, um, but they were hidden inside different directions, different directories. So here we're we're working on them directly to uh, submit uh, to using the PyANA subsystem. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't want to necessarily do a direct comparison, but. We are working at a fairly low level. We're editing config files, we're running Unix commands, and that's, that's what we do. So to actually make those darks, those dark averages, or uh, sorry, they're not, not necessarily darks, but they're data averages. Um, this is the command to send those jobs to the batch queues. So we have a command called CXILSF that manages submission of jobs I would imagine it's very similar to what Cheetah does, but it's on a command line basis. Um, and here I've written down what the command line parameters are. So there's a parameter that, to tell what the configuration file is, to tell where the output will be, to tell where the input data are, that's this, to tell which batch queue to use. S, that's a very, that's an important parameter. Um, We've, we've mentioned before that um, the, the, the run is divided up into different streams. It's multiplexed among, uh, among different DACs. Um, when we're trying to add up all the data from the run into a single average, we can't use that kind of, we can't um, separate out the multiplexed files 
among different nodes. We have to put everything on the same node. So that's what this S does. It funnels all the streams for the run into one processing node. It takes longer, but it is necessary for this first step. And for this reason, it's going to take about two hours to do some of these averages. So obviously, we're not going to do it live here. Um, I was really encouraged by the talk this morning because I think there's probably an NPI-based way to do this. And I'll bet that in a couple of weeks, we're going to have that implemented. So that this might go away, and it might be better. Although we still have to, we still have, to have enough uh, processing nodes at Slack to, to, to fit all of this. So then P8, that means that on each node, for each run, we're going to take eight CPUs on the node. This is the experiment number, the run number, and I mentioned the trial numbers yesterday. This is going to be trial zero. So this is what you would use to submit a job. Let, let's just try it. Let, let's cut and paste this. Um, well, that's not actually going to work the way I set it here. Um, I'm going to have to change this to my tutorial. Tutorial. Ah, there. And then cut and paste this. Does it work? Aaron, do you know if it's going to work? It's going to work. It's not going to work. And that is because, remember, I said it's trial zero. Well, I already ran this job, and I already put data into trial zero, and there's enough smarts in this script um, so that it doesn't overwrite the data. What it wants to do is it wants to use a, a new number that you haven't used before. So it's, it's a very primitive way, but it helps you manage your workspace. So I'm just going to take away the trial number and submit this. And in so doing, I let the LSF script figure out what the next trial number is, and it says it's trial number one. So it's actually running something now. And if I want to figure out what's running, I can say B jobs. And that's running. If I want to know everybody who's using the queue, I would say bjobs, Q, PS, Anna, CSQ, user all, you all. So there's quite a number of people from this group uh, running stuff on, um, yeah, all of the students are running jobs. Okay, so that's how I submit. And that was just for run 16. What if I want to submit averaging jobs for all of those runs together? Well, remember, I, I listed them out before. So I can actually see what runs I have. That's here. So I can just use some Unix commands to um, run the same batch submission job for all the runs. Is it, this is OK. I'm just using a Unix for loop. It's, um, it's just the way we do it. I, 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 I set a variable m equal to each run number, and then I interpolate the value of m in the submission script. Okay, so that's how we that's how we would submit a lot of batch jobs all at once. Now, let's find out what was in those files. So we can um, after we're done. Running those averages, we can yeah, cut and paste. So first thing I can do is find out if I have the, the average images. And that's this. So these are the average standard deviation and the maximum value composites. Um, I can also look at them in the image viewer, CCTVX image viewer. So I'm just stringing together a few Unix commands here. and. I'm making a list of all the max value composite uh, images that I produce, and I'm typing I'm typing those to the image viewer, and hopefully it won't take too long to actually run the viewer and show. I did patch into the Ethernet, so it should be moderately fast. All right, so here's the image viewer. I'm going to expand this just a little bit. 
And this is pretty much what you would expect. So I'm going to just double click here and open it up a little. So this is um, up here, there's a list of you know all the runs and the max value deposits. You know, Aaron, maybe this is something we should maybe try to alpha the tie or something. Yeah, at some point. I don't know why it comes up in this order, but it's just a random list of images. And this is what I would, I guess I would term this a good image. So this is, um, I, I see a clear powder uh, pattern for the rings. I think some of the other runs weren't so good. I think uh, maybe run 19, uh, if we look at that. Yeah, the, the, you can still see the powder rings, but they're a bit weaker. And some of them you can't see at all, I don't think. Run 16 is a little worse. And I actually looked through all of them. You can use the previous and next buttons. It turns out that run 31 here, let's see it. Uh, this is the dark. So that's one of the things I was looking for. I was trying to find the dark so that now I'm going to go back and I'm going to recalculate all of these uh, runs, but I'm going to be subtracting this dark image. Would you normally know the dark beforehand? Yes. So you, you just I was just going to ask why these I, are all dark. I, it's just uh, the, the reason is that um, we're downloading this data from the CXIDB. So it's a public website where the data are archived. And if we've done our job, we would have told you that dark is 31. But suppose I just gave you this data. So I mean, it's just a process of discovering what's there and to show you that you can still discover what's there even if you don't, if you're not told. And so, okay, so actually, so this, I'm going to, any questions about the viewer so far? We'll, we'll come back to the viewer uh, later on, but I'm going to close it now. The other way to discover what's in these files is to use our cxi.printpickle command. Remember I said that the, the format that we use to produce these images is called a pickle format. It's the way Python serializes data. So just going to show, again, I, I've strung together some Unix commands so that I can take the list of all of the max value composites and simply run them through this procedure to list out, uh, it's basically the header information in each file. So what you're getting is the detector distance and what else is important, the wavelength, I guess that's an average wavelength over all events in the run. Um, and I've used this printout to make this little table here. So it shows that there are all these runs, and um, I've just classified them by are they weak or strong, um, and whether what the wavelength was. And I guess the reason I did this is that in this data set, I'm going to be interested in the zinc metal, the anomalous signal, but run 71 through 73 don't have an anomalous signal from zinc because they're collected below the zinc edge. So I'm not going to be focusing on these three runs. I'm only going to be looking at the runs up here. Also, these are at different distances. And let me just make things a little simpler. I'm only going to be looking at runs 21 through 27 because it turns out that not only can I see that it's weak here, but also there aren't very many images in run 20. So even though it's strong, there's a lot of images, it, compared to the number of images here, it's just easier for us to focus on data from one distance. Why is this important? Because it turns out that you really have to determine the metrology separately when you look at data collected at different distances because we don't know the position of the rail or we haven't tried to figure that out. So the beam center might be slightly different by maybe a pixel, and that's going to affect how we determine the metrology. So this was a bit confusing um, earlier. Uh, we're not determining the positions of the individual tiles here when you change distances, but rather the overall position of the entire detector, essentially. Right. I mean, it's uh, we're also redesigning the software so that changes in distance will not trigger a requirement for determining the metrology over again. But this is still the future. 
So I'm pretty much telling you the way it is now. Although once we have the future software, we would be able to give it this old data set and sort of determine a global model of both the geometry of the tiles and where the rail was for translating the detector in space. So anyway, that's where we are. Questions about that uh, so far? Okay. All right, so I think one of the things I said here is that if you don't want to go through the two hours of calculating these darks, you can just take these file names from my scratch area, and you can use those um, and put them in your configuration file. Because it turns out that yeah, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a new configuration file here for uh, making averages. I'll show that here. So this is almost identical to what I showed before. There should be one difference. Yes, the difference is that now when I make averages, it's still running mod average, but now I'm giving it the path to the dark average and the dark standard deviation. And it's going to use those files that I just calculated for run 31. See, I, I hard-coded it in here, run 0031, so that now Anytime it goes through the data in the future, it's going to subtract the run 31 average away. Okay, so far? So that's, that is that. And now I'm going to calculate new average images with the dark subtracted away. So that here's the command again to run the CXI LSF. Uh, with this new configuration file that subtracts dark images off. Okay, now we're going to get into section two, prepare to mask out the untrusted pixels. So what, what am I talking about? I'm talking about hot pixels, where the pixel values are always too, too high, um, cold pixels, where they're always too low or zero, and even pixels which have a, a high standard deviation. I want to get rid of those. I want to find out where all these pixels are on the images. And it's even worse. Um, I, didn't, I didn't stress this before, but I'm going to run the CXI image viewer again. Um, for run 21. Let's look at that image carefully. See what the problem is here? There, there's some instrumentation inside the vacuum chamber. Might be, might be the liquid jet? No, it couldn't be liquid jet. What is this? Nozzle. Yeah, but it looks like it's on the bottom. So is it maybe the um, ray? Is it the, uh, it has something to do with the electrospray? It's the counter electrode. Counter electrode, yeah, it's creating the, the voltage uh, to shape the shape of the liquid jet. Um, but in any case, um, if we don't tell this <laughs> program what to do, it's going to try to predict brag spots down here, and we definitely don't want that. So part of what we're going to be doing in the next step is we actually use the image viewer to just choose coordinates for a polygon that we're going to use to mask this out. Um, it's just done very, so I, I basically point and click, and I read off the, the coordinates, um, yeah, where's my laser point, here, for slow and fast, and I actually have to use these coordinates to construct a polygon on the command line for the next step, where I'm going to make, gonna make a mask of untrusted pixels. And I'm going to do it in several steps. Um, so as you see, in order to do this, um, to get hot pixels, I'm going to use the average dark, also the standard deviation dark. But for the cold pixels, I'm going to be looking at one of these maximum composite images that has real data on it. So I'm going to be doing all of those things together. Maybe I'm not going to go into the details here. It's pretty well explained um, in this section here. So let's just... I'm going, to, I'm going to show the result of all this. So I'm going to look at the image viewer. And 
Yeah, okay, so let's see. I'm going to cctvx.imageViewer. I'm going to look at all the masks. And I'm going to put in a special command to say show untrusted equals true. see it? No? No? Okay. Well, um, let's zoom in. Ah, here we go. We're starting to see there were some places here that we had either hot or cold areas. So these pixels will be set to a value of minus two, it turns out, in all the images we produce, and then we won't integrate data there. And if we just look at the, um, the shadowed areas, do that. Yeah, here we go. Uh, seems right. So maybe maybe um, maybe it's clear. Maybe it isn't. But I made a different shadow mask depending on what the detector distance was. So I'm going to have to be. It's basically I'm going to have to do a lot of bookkeeping to make sure I'm using the right masks with the right runs. But for the example, I'm just going to go through a set of runs where all the processing is the same. And that has the most data in it. So I'm going to just remember where these masks are. And I'm going to put them somewhere. Oh, yes, well, this is important. Um, I did different things. So the, the, hot, the hot pixels were always the same, no matter what the detector distance was. So I calculated the, that mask. And then I separately calculated a mask where there were shadows. And then I wanted to combine the two masks together. So Aaron said, why don't you just make a command that says cxi.or mask? So we did. So that's this command, cxi.or mask. And you just feed it as many masks as you want, and it just sums them all up. And, it, and then the last parameter is the output. So the output is now in my scratch area where all the other data are. So that's that. So now I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is correct the detector metrology. Okay. So how many are still with me? Okay. So CXI. Why do we have this here now? I, I mean, I somewhat regret that I don't have a slide that sort of gives an overview of what we're doing. Um, maybe I'll actually try to show that again. Um, if I can get my talk from yesterday. Um, So one of the things I showed is that it's basically a set of a, a series of steps that we take in order to get the metrology right. The first step is to set the quadrant positions. That's this step. Then there's uh, sort of nearest unit tile translations, and then there's subpixel translations and rotations. So I'm going to be following that series of steps here. The first thing we do in order to look at detector quadrants is we have a, a GUI that does that. It's a special GUI. <coughs> yep. Copy and paste. Actually, maybe maybe I could ask, has anyone actually gotten to this position in the tutorial yet independently? <laughs> and again, like we say, I mean, this is this is new. We we've not um, we've not exposed this function to the user any time in the past. This is the first workshop that we've shown this, and this is the first group of students. So uh, you'll be testing out new stuff. So here's <laughs> here's the GUI. Here's the control panel for it here. 
And it's a little bit different from the image viewer. I have to zoom in uh, using this combo box. So I can zoom in to 400%. And now the um, positions, I don't know if you noticed, the, the, the unit cell dimensions for the thermal isom were on the command line when I ran the GUI here. Uh, up here. Uh, and the space group. So it's actually predicting the power pattern um, based on the known distance and the unit cell. And so the question is, are these, uh, and the, the thing is we're looking at the four sensors, these rectangles that are nearest to the direct beam as being representative of the quadrant they belong to, and we're trying to figure out if they fall on the on the powder ring. They don't really. It's about maybe two pixels off right over here. So we can actually, so what is this? This one is the lower right-hand quadrant, and I could actually change these numbers. Minus four, I'm gonna change that to minus seven. The change. Yeah, it does. See, if you're really, really patient, you can actually type in numbers and figure out the right displacements of these quadrants uh, relative to the to the sort of default standard input values um, and figure out what the right ones are. And then the other thing I, I used here, I'm going to show you a different way to do this in a second, but Still, the GUI is still the only way that we can figure out the dis detector distance. And when I did this really carefully, I figured out that a better distance was 176. So let me, let me try that again. So I, here's 171, the way it was before. Did, did anyone see, did it actually change? Yeah. Okay, so that's 171. Um, let's look at, maybe look at this gap over here on the very right-hand side. So now let's look at 176. Yeah, I mean, you have to kind of fiddle around with it a little bit, but um, 171 was not the right distance. So based on that, I had to change the detector Z offset. I'm not sure if this is quite clear in the tutorial. I think we might have to work on the documentation for that. Um, Aaron showed a way yesterday where you can determine the detector Z offset by submitting a whole bunch of batch jobs and seeing you know, what, the, what the best success rate is. I just showed you a graphical way of doing it. You can you know, take your choice. Um, there's, it, it does change, and I think it's important to optimize this for each experiment. So once I got those new quadrant positions, I can I can, I can now put them in a fill file. I'll show that in a minute. There's another way to do this as well with an automated script. I'm going to cut and paste that. It's called CSPAD Quadrants, and it runs on one of these maximum value composite pickles, and just shows you how fast it is. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm determining the right position for the quadrant based on taking the quadrant and then calculating a self-correlation with it rotated 45 degrees. So if it's in the right position, then um, the autocorrelation should be maximized when I rotate it. So in the end, it just tells me the old quadrant translation positions were here. These are the new ones that we really need to use. And when I looked at these in the GUI, you can actually cut and paste these onto the command line into the GUI that I just uh, showed you. And they were kind of good. I think um, this automated procedure is just about as good as you can do by eye, but it's more convenient to run. So we're going to use these, but we know we're going to have to do some refinement on this. And that's what we're going to do in the next step. So I just want to show how you do this. So we're doing that. I'm going to need to show you how we, remember I, I said that the next step, I, I said this yesterday, the next step is going to, what is it, Nadia? I'm just something back to help me. 
Um, in the next step, um, we're going to be looking at brag spots that we've indexed and figure out, based on these tile positions, if we can get better tile positions based on where the spots are predicted to be and where they observed to be. So for doing that, I need to index all the data, all these 10,000 images. So I'm going to do that with a batch script. And I'm going to use a new configuration file that I will now introduce to do data integration. So even though we're using this for metrology, we're also going to be using the same configurations uh, later when we do the real integration step. So I've changed the Dead Sea offset uh, from 571 to 576. Now I'm adding something. Remember I said I was masking out the untrusted pixels? This is the mask path that I'm using to do that. And I'm adding a new line. I'm using an X, oh, actually I should mention, I'm running in a completely different module. I'm not running mod average anymore. I'm running something called mod hit find index. So it's, it's what we use to do indexing and integration. Um, so that's here. And in order to run that, we always need a crystal target. And that's a set of parameters that CCTVX needs um, to understand how to integrate this data. So I'm going to show you that now. So here's my, it's, a, it's called a fill file. The fill doesn't stand for anything important. It's just Python hierarchical interchange language, which is something we invented, which is basically a set of parameters. So there are parameters and values. It's just keyword and value. That's all it is. And if you want to get fancy, sometimes there's namespacing. So uh, we can put stuff in parentheses to segregate it by topic area. But in any case, it's just a set of parameters. It's the same format as Phoenix DFS. It is the same format that Phoenix uses for all of its command line input. And also dials will use this as well. So if you're, <laughs> if you're uh, familiar with these, then this will be uh, something that's easy. So uh, what's important here? Well, one of the things that's important is the quadrant displacements that I just determined. So I have to take those numbers, which are x, y displacements for the different quadrants, and I put them into the fill file. Um, a lot of these, well, what I intend for you to do here is just to take this file that I give you and use it. Okay, but I can also spend a few minutes going through what some of these parameters are. Some of them are important, some of them are not as noteworthy, so I won't discuss them, but let me go through them and, you know, so here is the target unit cell, and that's important. It turns out that when we know the unit cell, we can use a different algorithm to choose the basis vectors when we index, and its, it's uh, success rate is higher. If we're looking for a totally, different, or a totally unknown unit cell, we can run a set of integration jobs, and maybe we'll get 50% or uh, you know, half the success rate. And then we just look at those, those uh, unit cells that we get out of the integration, and we say, oh, and we, we run Oliver's clustering program, and you know, we see this is, this is the mean uh, unit cell for our data. So then we take those values and we put them here in the fill file. So that helps us in the indexing process get this unit cell. Um, and really the basis for that is that we're, we're running a different, slightly different algorithm. We're, we're doing a directed search for basis vectors that have this length and this uh, angular separation. So it's a different algorithm, so it's, it's more successful. The known setting is important. Um, it, goes, it's, it goes along with the cell dimensions. Um, what it's telling you is the Brevet lattice. Um, the numbering scheme is a little bit hard to understand, so I'm going to go to a different part of our wiki to show you. This part of the wiki is just a page called fill. And there's a definition here. Uh, it's actually different crystal systems have different numbers. And if you, if you look here, I'm using known setting equals 12, which corresponds to the hexagonal setting, which is thermal icing. And if anyone knows the answer to why we chose these particular numbers, um, you can raise your hand. Um, it doesn't matter for this conversation. It's of interest um, in another context. Um, 
What's that? No, it's actually labeled it, but it, it has to do with um, it, it has to do with the, what are the possible choices for the brevet setting. And in the type, in the in the hexagonal setting, there are twelve possible groups and subgroups, and the hexagonal one is the highest one, so it's number twelve. So that's why I say known setting equals twelve. But thanks for the interest. It's it's. <laughs> It's a fairly obscure point. We also want to know what the highest resolution uh, we're going to use is different parts of the program have a possibility to do different resolution settings, but we just use the same. So we're going to integrate out to 2.1 angstroms here, here, and here. And actually, it's not quite true. What we're going to do is we're going to pick bright spots out to 2.1 angstroms, and then we're going to attempt to integrate as far as we can based on those spots. So we're, it's not really a limit. It's only a limit for spot finding. Um, what else is important? So Aaron uh, talked at great length yesterday about these three parameters, the minimum spot area. So we're actually only picking spots of area two and greater here. And then signal height and spot height, which he talked about. Um, what else is important? Um, yeah, second lines. Where is it? Ah, right. So, <laughs> So if this is commented out. Um, the way it is now, we're going to index one lattice. If we actually wanted to look for a second lattice, we could run this fill script again with this commented in. So indexing outlier detection switch equals true gets you the second lattice. Uh, we've put in a comment here because otherwise you would never know what that meant. But that's what it means. So you, uh, the way we do it now is we run an entirely separate batch job just to find the second lattice. Um, maybe we'll put in more comments in the, in the tutorial to get that. And you know, and I think in this, in this data set, it only gets us 10% more lattices than we have. So it's not a big difference. Uh, so what else is important? Well, this turned out to be a big problem, a big mistake last night. When I, when I was making the, and I still haven't fixed it, um, I forgot to put the mask pixel value in. Remember the masks with the red pixels, the pixels that we don't trust? We have to tell the integrator that we don't trust them, and this is how you do it. And I, I, I omitted that when I ran, when I made the tutorial. So I came up with R factors that I thought were too high, and I, I think it's because I forgot to put this in. So I was actually integrating rag spots where there was uh, just garbage. Um, background factor, it just says that we're trying to get, we're subtracting the background from the Bragg spots and we're using twice as many background pixels as signal pixels. Um, you know, I know I'm going to get attacked for this by James here. Detector gain, really, really the program only uses a, a gain of one. We don't really put a lot of, we haven't put a lot of effort into figuring out the gain. And we certainly haven't figured it out on a per pixel basis, which we really should. But I'm going to go with what you said, that the partiality is a far bigger issue. So uh, the gain is something we'll, we'll figure out later. I also mentioned before that, the, that for getting the mosaicity, we need the maximum, uh, maximum likelihood refinement target. That's important. Um, and I think for the other things, you can just take these defaults. So that is the fill file. And once we've done that, once we have a configuration file that refers to a fill file and the fill file, we can start running batch jobs to do the integration over each run. So for each run, there's a, a batch job. And this is a way of submitting several at once. So it's just this command. And I don't think I'm going to actually type it in. Um, as you know, the bkill command, that's for stopping jobs that don't really work. So now let's see if we've gotten the results. This is just like a big ls command. I mean, I, I want to see how many, how, many, um, how, many, how many images integrated for each run. And for each image that integrates, I get a pickle file containing the structure factors. So I'm just going to do a, a cut and paste of this command. Aaron 
looks like he wants to say something, but let's just do that. So this is just by run, and this is how many um, images are integrated for each of the runs. So there are 19,000 altogether. But like I said, I'm only going to focus on runs 21 through 27, and that's most. Yes? I think that when you look at the directory structure of, of results. So, right, the directory structure. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll cut and paste that. So for each run, um, so what do we have there? There are several runs. Let's let's pick one, run 27. And there's different trial numbers. Like I said, we're, we're segregating our trials. And so let's just look at trial number three. So what would you like me to say here, Aaron? What we have is we have, oh, we have one directory that has, is called integration, that has the structure factors. There's one directory that has, it's called out, and that has images in it. So we've actually pulled out the images that appear to have rag spots and that indexed. And then standard out um, is a directory that has uh, log files from all this. So that's, I don't know how much detail we want to get into. Let's, let's go into standard out. And <coughs> who knows what I did wrong? Slash at the beginning. Uh, slash at the beginning. Okay. Um, more of this. Okay. So it goes through all the images until it finds one that thinks has spots on it. Oh, that's not going to work. Some of them don't index and throw error messages. This may not. So this is one that it thinks is good, and it uses label it to index them. So this is where the different brevet settings are listed. So that's that. And then sure enough, it's come, it's come up with a hexagonal lattice, and it's got the right unit cells. So then it's going to find, it's going to refine, it's doing refinement of the mosaicity and the domain size. And then, then it goes back again, and it applies the hexagonal constraints, and it does it all over again, and it integrates the data, it writes it out. So I'm not going to go through all of that. But that's, so that's one of them. There's a log file there for each of the streams. Right, and now I'm going to go into the out directory, and there is going to be something, uh, several thousand images. Maybe we should pick one of them. Sure enough, it's got some brag spots. And I think in just a minute, we're going to go back. Oh, actually, we can do it now. Um, let's use an interactive mode to try to index this image. So I think it's important to always look at where the brag spots are predicted to be, which ones are being integrated, to see if the data is really there. So let's, let's do this. We're going to use a command called cxi.index, cxi index. We have to give it a fill file as target. So x.target, oh no, just target equals. Was it Aaron? Thermo Bison Four ninety. Four oh right. Four So yeah. 
again, this what, what we're doing here is we're reproducing the work that had been done in batch mode, but we're doing it interactively. So again, we're refining the orientation in a triclinic setting, and we're going to show the triclinic solution. So here it is. So let's just focus. I don't know. We'll, we'll maybe we'll zoom in on some of the brag spots and just have a look. So let's see how well we did. Let's just go here. All right. I'm going to change the contrast a little bit so it's just a little bit clearer. All right. That sounds like a question I need to answer. All right. So the red spots are the bright spots from Spot Finder program. Those are found first. And then we derive a lattice model, and we use the model to predict where the spots, where all the spots are. So we should be finding both the red spots and some other spots. And I guess that's true here. So here's a red spot. The, the fact that there's yellow here indicates that we're predicting a spot there, and the yellow shows you the background that's being used for that spot. And the blue shows you spots that, I don't know, is it, can I actually see the blue? Let me, let me change the, uh, to a different display mode. Okay, here. So this shows us that we're attempting to integrate a signal um, with these blue spots and these yellow background spots. And in many cases, I find that predictions exactly overlap the spot finder spots. And in some cases here, here's a predicted spot that I not only see, I do not see a spot finder spot, but I don't see a signal either. Um, so this is a little bit of a worry, but I also see spots on many images where I'm predicting spots that really are there. And I don't know if I'm going to find them here. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a little bit over here. I'm not going to work too hard. It definitely works. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I think this is related to what I was showing at the very first slide yesterday. We are really integrating a lot of spots that aren't there. And I think we have to do a little bit better. But what I'm looking for is spots that don't have red, because the red has is spot finder spots, and I know that they are there. I'm looking to find out if the lattice model is predicting any spots that are in between those those spot finder spots that are part of the, the, the real signal where I needed the lattice model to predict them. And it's not clear in this case that I'm finding any. I mean one thing is that this data is, you know, a lot of this data is pretty bright, and maybe we don't need the model to predict things. Maybe that's a good example. Okay, so there's a spot. We're predicting it in the right place. It wasn't found by Spot Finder, but it's there, and we're integrating. It looks like we're integrating all the signal. It's only about one pixel. I one and a half pixels. Yeah. It's Hard to see. Actually, this, this, if you see down here, in the very bottom, it shows the intensity of the pixel. So this is actually 213 counts versus a background of where the level is less than 100. So there really is signal there. It's very high standard deviations. All right. I mean, the... We tried this in Crisfell. I mean, what does Crisfell do, Tom? What sense? I 
I'm finding a lot of predictions here where I do not see signal. Yeah, so the values in big files control predictions, so the geometrical model that tells it which collection should be there, and you're supposed to optimize those values to get the best visual thing. Um, in the next beta version, we're going to try now automatic information. Right, um, so I agree that it's important. And here, we've done an automatic determination, which, however, may be so optimal. But this is the best we can do. But the question is, how, how good can you get? So it's a balance, right? It's a trade-off. You can either predict too many or too few spots. So in this case, I still think that I'm predicting too many. And this is why my histograms look like there's a lot of measurements of zeros. And the question is, how well can you do? So how well are you predicting the spots at high resolution? How well do you match? Can you show some of these at high resolution? Well, this is 2.5 rank. This is right at the edge of the detector right here. Um, the, uh, it's the same story in the corners. This data only goes out to about 1.8 inches. So let's, let's look at it. So I'm just trying to do a quick look. I can see, so here is, wait a minute. No, I, I confused. Did we just oh, crash? How did that happen? Uh, all right, I, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> we can try it again. Uh, actually, can we get back to this? I, I, I think um, I'm going to try to move on. There is, I mean, I don't know if there's that much else to show, but um, I think I was in the middle of discussing um, the topology. <coughs> And I sort of like to indicate what the next step was. So the next step was um, after we integrated the data to get some predicted spots, then we could do another uh, determination of metrology. And here's how to do it. It's, it's just a, a big command. And I'm going to show the commands. But one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to modify it. You can, so this command says to determine the metrology on the detector using um, this set of results. So actually, I do a run star, so it uses all the runs. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll show you. Uh, we, we should be a little bit more explicit about it. So I'm only going to do it on run 21. And I'm, I'm going to limit it to a certain number of images. So here I said 1,000. That's what I would recommend for real production work. But that takes a long time. So I'm just going to do it on 100 images. So 100 images. Um, reads in 100 images. It does refinement on, on a target function, which I showed yesterday. It's just the displacement between observed and predicted spots. But the parameters that we're refining are the tile positions and rotations, as well as the crystal orientations and the unit cell dimensions. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. So it just shows you that the refinement is going on. Um, it's getting some results. This is, for example, a list of the different tiles, the, the ASICs on the detector. And this tells you the displacement, the radial and transverse displacements in units of pixels. Um, we're doing a separate refinement here on the unit cell dimensions because we couldn't put everything together. It was, it was too big a refinement job, so we separate things out. Um, I guess I'd say that this output file wasn't necessarily meant for general consumption. It doesn't say very clearly. Again, we've, we haven't exposed this to the user until just this week. So now that I'm looking at it, I think it could be better documented. The important thing is to go in here and find 
And, and this is explained on the wiki. You have to find this little bit, tile translations equal. And this part is cut out of the log file and pasted into the fill file. So in the fill file now, that little bit is pasted in. Right, so there's, okay, so we're doing an iterative procedure where we first determine the integer values and we and then we go back and we re-index all, of, we, we run those batch jobs all over again. And we keep going until this little chunk that comes out is no longer changing. So all of these integers are the same as it was in the previous cycle, or maybe just one in the corner is different. But then, then I stop and I look at the very bottom of the, the output, where it gives rotations in fractions of a degree and translations in fractions of a, degree, of a, of a pixel. But you notice here, this, this is the first iteration. So these, um, these fractional translations are, are all greater than one in magnitude. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to iterate again before I do the subject. Is that, is that clear? I just want to get, I want to re-index the images so that I get um, the best. And, and there's some, um, part of this is historical, and part of this will go away when we redesign using the dials framework. Um, but this is the way it is now. It's, it's a little cumbersome. It requires an iterative procedure. I think we could streamline it a little bit more, but it, it does work. Multiple places we can do it right. Yeah. Well, let me show you what happens when you put all of the, here, this is the version, this is the trial three fill file. So here's what I showed before, that here are the, the integer tile translations and then the fractional tile translations are up here. It's a, it's a different fill parameter name. It's called integration subpixel joint model rotations equals and translations equals. And by the time I get to this iteration, all the translations are less than one magnitude. All right, and let's just look at the rotations. These are expressed in units of degrees. So there are some tiles that are 0.5 degrees rotated. And that's uh, it's a little startling. <laughs> some detective guys, where are you? So that's... So that's um, how to make the fill file. I mean, I've showed how to do integration, and maybe it's time to merge uh, to merge the data now. So I'm just going to, we're kind of winding up. So merging the data, here's, it's a separate program. I create a separate directory to do it. Um, Nick, yes. This is the first yeah. point in the procedure where we're, we've essentially left IANA. Right. It's worth, right. It's worth noting. So, right. So, Piana is used to unpack the raw XTC stream and do something with it. So, and maybe maybe this is a good time to say. Remember, I mean, remember I showed two different ways. Right? You can either integrate things in batch mode, or you can integrate interactively the way I showed with the graphical display using CXI index. But Aaron has actually gone a step further. He says, well, the the, the standalone indexing is an important way of doing work. So CXI index not only does things graphically the way I showed, but if you have 10,000 pickles that you want to re-index with a different set of fill parameters, you can do it with CXI index, I believe, and you're even contemplating adding multiprocessing. It's there. It's already there. Uh, is, can I do it by just, can I, can I show that? Yeah, so um, go to directory with a, a few images. Huh? Well, I think this qualifies. Uh, how many are there? Yeah. Uh, okay. 3,000. Yep, so it would be cxi.index. Dot .index. Uh -huh. So minus D, this turns off the display. Yeah. Um, minus N, 16. Minus N16, what does that do? That's 16 cores. So 16 these, cores. So Nick has logged into PSN and CS 
062, and this is one of the nodes in the CSQ, and all of those nodes have 16 cores. So this will just try to use all of them, right? And then, um, and then target equals. Target equals, yeah. It's, uh, it's the same. Oh, I don't know if I have a command anymore. Uh, um, whatever your profile would be. Uh, That's it. So um, uh, D N sixteen. Yep. Space between N sixteen. Yeah. And then you can just say um, you can say uh, minus O and then some directory to put the results in. You don't actually have to output the results if you don't want to. Okay. So I could actually put it under dot dot, dot out to or something yeah. like that. Yep. Okay. And then. Um, does it create the directory? It doesn't I think exist. you might have to create it yourself. Ah. And then, um, then say start out pickle or just dot saying which would mean current directory. Okay. Yeah, see, that doesn't exist. Okay. Alright. Should, this should index the data multi processing manner once All it right. starts up. It takes a bit to start up. Okay, so the point is that you can also uh, you can also run this uh, integration without relying on without relying on IANA. I see. So it's it's going to output a lot of stuff to yeah, the screen. Yeah, it kind of takes all the all the logs right. and goes. Um, I'm going to try to together control out of this. Yeah. So now I'm going to go up. I already created the directory uh, before where I I, uh, I do all the merging. No. Okay. There's another username called South. No, that's where I copied the data for you. Yeah. And, and then you made a new one because I didn't have the information. Well, let's see what I say here. Um, scratch and case order merge says should be here, but it isn't. So I'm not going to dwell on it right now. I'm just going to go to the, the, the command script, and it is here. Um, so it's, it's built on the same architecture as these other CCTBX commands. It, it has all these fill parameters. Um, in this case, we're not putting the fill parameters in a file. We're, we're putting them on the command line, but it's the same idea. It's just keywords and values, and we're bringing all of these parameters um, to bear on the merging problem. So, for example, here we're using 16 processors to read all the data in from the different um, pickle files that have the structure factors, and the names of all those files are given um, in this command, this is just um, this is actually um, a Unix command that uses Python to get the whole list of integration pickle files. So that's all this data, and then I interpolate that information um, onto the command line, which is down here. I would just say take the script the way I've written it and cut and paste your your directory names in here, and it will work. Um, I'm using um, a model of thermal isen from the PDB. I actually get that model very clever. I use phoenix.fetchpdb dash dash mtz, and I give it the PDB code. And I use this for two things. One is to get an overall scale factor for each image, and also to report whether or not the data is isomorphous or not. So I get an R iso uh, number. So let's go back again to the merging script. Um, what else is important? Um, so it just shows here where I'm, I'm setting that isomorphous model. It's using this PDB uh, file. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything here that is particularly noteworthy. I'm just going to use the defaults. So I'm going to merge stuff together. Merging directory is likely to have to be storage. Sorry. 
The merging directory it's there. It's, it's there. has been restored. Well, that's really odd. Okay. <laughs> How did that happen? It's a long story. <laughs> okay. So E157. And these are the merging results. I'm not really sure I want to look at the log file. I, I'll, I think I have a little bit of it here on the web page. So um, this is the very bottom of the log file. It shows a resolution breakdown of uh, the multiplicity of observation. So down at 2.1, I get a multiplicity of only two, or actually, you know, only a very small amount. And as I've applied a different resolution cutoff to each image, it, this is something we can ask, how many of the 17,000 images actually had the fraction out to 2.1? And that's only uh, 1,700. But I think that there's a mistake here. I, I think the fact that we didn't have the mask in there has degraded the results. So I, I'm willing to bet if somebody uh, reproduces these results, that is probably going to go up, maybe by a factor of two. Maybe it'll go up to 3,000. And hopefully the R factors will get better. So that's the number of images. And then basically down here, the CC int, int means internal, so that's the CC one half, uh, which here is 90%. And this is the CC ISO. It's a, it's a correlation coefficient against the isomorphous synchrotron data set from the PDB, 87%, uh, and that's it. So that's the merging statistics. And then we can run stuff through uh, phoenix.x triage, um, as I suggested yesterday. Um, I'm just going to say quickly what I did without really getting into the results here. Um, we also then did molecular replacement using Phoenix. Um, strange as it may seem, I'm not really that familiar with the Phoenix GUI, and I'm only using commands that my colleague Nat Eccles has given me, which is all done on the command line. So when I do the molecular replacement, I just use a command line version of Phoenix, which is this, phoenix.automr, and I give it a replacement model and the MGZ file from the merging procedure that I just showed, and the sequence, and that's it. And then I do some refinement, again, on the command line. Um, it's basically just the only thing that uh, comes into play here is that I have to have already figured out what free R flags I'm going to set. I always use the same R free flags for all of the work we do in Thermalyzin uh, ever. So it's always the same. And it's shown here on the command line. And then there's a special script. So here's where I got the R factors, and I believe these R factors are a little bit too high. So hopefully someone will run this again and get better R factors with the same data. Um, again, after we do that, here's one final command. So this is a script that Nat Eccles just gave me that picks out the metal positions and calculates a map with the anomalous signal and looks at what is, the, what is the height of the map at those sites. So here it is. So at the zinc, it's six sigmas. So that's the end of the tutorial. Hopefully, there's, a, there's some anomalous signal. Even, this is the data we already published. And in the publication, we didn't, we didn't say anything about the anomalous signal. We didn't even know it was there. But then we, got, we collected this other data set for thermal ice and that we published in the Nature Communications that came out um, in July, and we realized that, you know, there is signal there, so why don't we go back to this old data set, and sure enough, it's here. It's not strong enough to do sad phasing by any means, but it's, it's, it's visible in the electron density map. The only thing to note here is that when I told you I did a merging script, it actually did merging twice, once with anomalous, merging the anomalous together, and once without. And that's taken care of right here. There's just a flag that's set somewhere about anomalous. I don't see it. Merge, merge anomalous. 
Merge anomalous. Well, I still don't see it. Oh, if you like. I'll put it in here. First, I do it merge anomalous false, then merge anomalous equals true, and I switch between them just using said. Uh, so it's just Unix stuff, and I run it twice down here. Okay. Oliver is going to show us what we can do about looking at unit cell ensembles. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to look in the same result directory that we did before. We're just going to show this was mksolder slash results. And what run am I going to look at? Run ro22 slash 003. No? One more zero in the high. Oh. And then out. Sure. Uh, results E157. Normally you don't need to do that, but uh, CD integration. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Well, that's how this works. Um, so first, let's just take a look at how many files we have here. So 530 files, which is a pretty reasonable number to have a, a bit of a poke around with. Um, so usually the first thing I do when, when trying to figure out stuff is try and find the answer to the life of the universe and everything. So that would be cluster.42. Um, and if we just go minus h, and then wait for the interweb, you can see you've got a few options. You can so there are help messages like this for them, but let's just start by running it with the defaults. So I'll just clear my way for a little bit. Essentially, the way all of the clustering toolkit um, programs work is you give them a list of folders. It will go through these folders recursively. So if we go up one level, it will try and do it for everything. Um, so be aware of that. Then you can tell it that you want to see things in logarithmic. Um, you can give it a fast option. And you want to set the threshold interactively, which we'll see about uh, very shortly. So uh, normally for 500 images, when there isn't a huge amount of load, it should run of the order of seconds. Um, everything seems to be a bit slow at the moment. I've, uh, in my experience, it's tractable to run these kinds of clusterings up to about 5,000 images. After that, it starts getting very slow. So for those who are interested, um, I mean, almost Almost all kinds of clustering algorithms run in roughly n square time. Um, it's possible to do some uh, density based ones that run in n log n time, which will be a lot quicker. And we're kind of exploring that at the moment. Right, so this is the output of cluster.42. So on the top, you've got the um, display of the orientations. And actually, this is kind of interesting because what you're seeing is that the a axis tends to be pointing either towards the beam or at um, 180 degrees to the beam. Most of the time, and the c-axes are always kind of upwards or downwards. So there is a bit of, um, it looks like there is a bit of alignment going on here. And we were totally unaware of this. Yeah. We, we, we've had this data for three years. It, it, it's worth pointing out that if you, it, it kind of looks worse than it is, right? So if you look at the color, the range of the color bars here, you're going from like 0 to 0 0.3. So it's not actually in terms of like random units, it's when it's really bad, it, uh, that goes up to like two or something. Um, and this will be reflected if you look at your multiplicity within a range of reciprocal space. Then at the, uh, at the bottom here, you've got a dendrogram. Where, um, so you can see again that there are a lot, a lot of images which are almost exactly the same. So in terms of these, these are angstrom squared between the unit cells. And uh, the distance defined in terms of angstrom squared is, well, how do you deal with A, B, C, and then you've got angles. So you define it in what we call G6, which is you go A squared, B squared, C squared, then it's um, B, C, cos alpha, um, A, C, cos beta, etc. Um, anyway, so this is really close. Like 300 is, means these are all very, very similar. But you can see again, you get this kind of hierarchy with ones, can you get more? In this case, I would keep everything. I wouldn't bother about doing the threshold. But just for demonstration, let's imagine that we want to we'll crop things, say, here, which is about 60. So let's close this. And now what we can do is we can run 
just the unit cell plus the dot unit cell minus uh, H. Let's take over the options. What's the typical cutoff value? So the default cutoff value is about 5,000. Um, and it, it really depends on, on what, you're, uh, what you're looking at. If you do have this kind of one population, like what we see here, then usually I would tend to try and include everything, because if you're going to be moving forward and using this kind of refinement scheme, the outliers might get pulled in. And if they don't get pulled in, they'll get rejected anyway. Um, if you have more than one population, what you want to do is just uh, look whereabouts you'll have to go, such that I'm pruning those two populations, and then set your threshold using that. So the idea is to reset to separate out the clusters, which may actually be like, functionally different. So here we said we'd go for t around 60. Um, let's, do, let's make it a log plot. Why not? Um, yeah, so let's do that. Oh, and let's also tell it to do it on this one. So now this is just going to do that. So the options, you, the minus fast option, uh, which has actually changed to a different name in the latest commit, um, will just use Euclidean distance rather than the Andrews Bernstein distance. Um, usually that's okay. It gives you about a factor of two speed up. Um, if you don't desperately need that, I probably would want to stick with the one which works. The cases where the Euclidean distance gets fudgy is if you have a cluster which extends over a um, over a symmetry range. So here you can see that we've now identified this big yellow cluster. And because we put it at 60, which is, you can see at the bottom down here, this is where it's going to appear. So yeah, 60 is kind of here. That's exactly where it's trimmed. So every time it goes across here and it cuts something, it's going to create a cluster. So actually, if we now, if we actually look here, you can see that they're named. So the big one here was called cluster 22. Right? So now if we um, LS, uh, maybe not just stop pickles. Uh, so if we LS star dot numbers, yeah, now you've got the clusters dot list. So if you actually uh, less one of these, so cluster, this is where all the files are relative to where you ran it. Now, if you wanted to use, um, I know that with the shortly. Uh, very soon to be released prime.postrefine programs, you can then actually use these as the input for your post-refinement directly. All you have to do is you have to give it a number of files. And actually, um, the CXI merge take a list of files and not it? Could be set up. Uh, it or it takes a list of directories right now. Right. But it could with little Python. Yeah. So if you can take a list of files, it's very easy. You just impact takes cat this thing, and it will give you it as a list of files. So it lets you hand these clusters straight into whatever merging procedure you want. And then you can play around and say, you know, if I put my threshold here, can I try using a cluster? Am I going to get better merging results? Or overall, is it not going to pay off? And in terms of general advice, is that a good idea or not? Right now, it depends on the case, and we don't really know. Um, sometimes it seems to help. Clearly, you've got two really different things. It helps to cut out the outliers. Um, but sometimes it's better to throw everything in. And hopefully, as, as, as a community, you get more experience doing these things and trying more things, we'll be able to have more general guidelines. But right now, it's just about putting as many tools as possible in your hands to be able to get a sense of what's going on, try different stuff, and see what works best. Yeah? Did you show the average unit sets for all the, all the clusters that have been found? Um, yeah, so if we go all the way back up to here. So that's what's in this command line output here. So you've got the cluster, the median A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma, and then the standard deviations here for all the clusters, and then also the ones which weren't members of clusters, the singletons are displayed at the bottom there. So that comes out in the command line. Um, you can also, we can might as well use the other one. So, so we can go cluster dot um, individual frame intensity. So here it's just telling you, you know, I can't read in a list of files. It's not a pickle. Well, that's good. And then this, you can just click through these, and it gives you a, a very quick sense of saying, you know, well. 
some of these which I've integrated are probably not great. Like this is not a good image. So we know that we're getting some misintegration. What's, what in this image is wrong? Uh, there aren't many spots. And if usually if you guys look at them with the image on the side. Page through. Yeah. Um, what if? What about whether or not those are just images that don't diffract to a very high resolution? Yeah. So we can, if we find another one which is really scarce, sparse, ah, sparse, it could also be that. Yeah, you're quite right. This one here is going. So the the yeah. two things that would affect this are resolution limit and the mosaicity parameter, mm -hmm. which change it. It's yeah. fit for each. It's fit differently for each image. Yeah. So this one is very low resolution. It's going to 0 0.03 versus 0 0.03 again, but 0 0.05, etc. So. Um, and then again, you can get, as we were saying before, I think some people were mentioning that looking at your work, James mentioned looking at your Wilson statistics, overall can be kind of useful. Now, I want to be very clear, this isn't a Wilson plot, it's a, at best, it's a pseudo Wilson plot, but it is completely unprocessed. You haven't fiddled around, just looking straight at your partial intensities. So, if you go to intensity statistics, right? It looks fairly coherent. There's a, a really quite a, quite a tight grouping of the G's, of the D's, relatively speaking. Most of the standard deviations on the fits are kind of good. There are obviously some outliers out here. Um, so it's it's informative, essentially, about the fact that these are pretty sensible data. So you just wrote in 500 pickle files, just yeah. like that? Yeah. Did you use one thread or 16 threads? Uh, in this case, just, um, I'm using, yeah, one thread. Very fast. Well, I'm not, I'm not doing anything like extraneous or anything. Basically. Also, I think that Python does like semi buffers and stuff okay. under the hood. Right. So, like, if you read in 500 images the first time, it's slow, and if you read it in two minutes later. Yeah. So, it puts it in faster than like that. Anyway, so that's the kind of thing you can do, and then you can try, say, reintegrating, looking at it again, um, and using this as part of your sort of iterative process. Any questions?